thank you so much, God, for having us here with you, for drawing us together with each other and closer to you, God. Teach us to surrender in this life of ours, in this life that you've called us to. Teach us to surrender the anxiety. Teach us to surrender the fear. Teach us to surrender everything that does not do good in this world for you, God. Everything that you do not call good. Teach us to let it go. Teach us to surrender everything to you, God. And fill us more of you and not of ourselves. We just thank you so much for guiding us in this life, God, and loving us so abundantly, Lord. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Thank you, Melanie. Oh, man. That was a blessing. Oh, my goodness. All right. Let's see if we are centered here. And, uh, man, worship was beautiful. Thank you so much, Melanie. Really appreciate it. Man, it feels so good to be able to worship on Wednesdays. And I really appreciate all that our worship team is doing for us on Wednesdays. And it's just, uh, you know, there's nothing like good worship to get you ready for the teaching of the word so we find ourselves this um evening in first samuel chapter eight we're just going to kind of recap first samuel chapter eight and then get into chapter nine so uh we'll see what the lord has for us uh this evening but uh before we get started i just want to remind you to download uh the church app if you have not already uh the church app you can find on the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. You could download Church Scribe and uh, simply just go to the icon that's downloaded on your device and go to the drop down menu, choose Calvary Chapel Eastvale. The icon will change to our logo and uh, then you'll, be, you'll have at your fingertips everything that you need to know about Calvary Chapel Eastvale. And uh, as well as the website is being updated right now, we're going to be updating the website with our staff photos and some more photos of our events and some cool photos throughout the year, uh, being out at the parking lot or at the park actually uh, for the last year. Uh, we've been gathering at American Heroes Park in Eastvale for some time now. It's been a year. I, I just can't believe how fast this just has all gone by. And uh, we find ourselves coming into the end of this uh, um, hoax, I mean, uh, pandemic, but <laughs> I'm just kidding, uh, but uh, this pandemic, seriously. And, and uh, we just think that uh, uh, of all the people that have been affected by this, I've had family members pass away from this COVID and, and affected by this COVID. So the virus has been real, but we see ourselves coming to the end, I feel. Uh, everything's starting to open up. Uh, Texas has reported no COVID deaths in the last two months since they've opened up. And I think now all the other states are going to start following in suit, uh, seeing that we're approaching what they call herd immunity. So it's, it's pretty cool to see what's happening and, and, how, and I'm curious to see how the church is weathered. Um, it's interesting this last Sunday, I saw quite a few people. I noticed, I noticed you. But uh, a lot of people I haven't seen in probably a year, and me and Pastor Ken were talking about it, and, and, uh, but uh, you know what, it, it, it encouraged my heart because I knew that you were, you were watching, you knew we were at where, where your church was at, and uh, you just felt more comfortable to, to be at home. That's no problem. I'm not going to, uh, you know, really fault you for what is happening, you know, around us right now. You know, it's just... Uh, you know, I just praise God that we had the uh, technology be able to do what we're doing today, Facebook Live, and and now uh, we're uh, we've taken it a step further. On Sundays, we're live streaming YouTube Live and Facebook Live simultaneously. So uh, whether it be YouTube, uh, you know, you could tune into YouTube on your TV or Facebook, or just simply live stream through the website or the church app. So uh, both uh, are available to you, or all, all three are available to you on Sundays, as well as uh, it's great to see you at the park on Sunday. So 
Uh, we park in our cars. Some people sit outside, some people inside. We have the donut bar, the coffee bar. And, um, you know, last week the kids uh, uh, cooked up some scrambled eggs, our youth ministry, uh, scrambled eggs, bacon, and pancakes. And it was just a great, just an, an amazing, encouraging Sunday this last mm-hmm. Sunday. We had Ben Corson with us, of course, and he's always uh, a treat. He's a blessing. Always blesses us uh, with a powerful message and and uh, I'm I'm just uh, tremendously blessed to see what what the Lord is doing with Calvary Chapel Eastvale. So continue to pray uh, for all that is in store for us as a church, uh, building wise, uh, where the next move is. We know that we're going to start going indoors around July 1st or, or the July 4th. I think is the first Sunday of July, and uh, so we just. Uh, take it one step at a time. Uh, we are going to have uh, both outside and inside available for you. Uh, the FM transmitter will still be available. You'll still be able to listen in your cars. We'll have some outdoor city, seating and indoor seating. So we'll see how the Lord works it out. But uh, the Lord is in control. And I'm just really encouraged to see uh, you walking in faith and in courage and I just really feel that God has something really special in store for you. And as you spend time with the Lord, as you spend time in prayer, you know, this is just a small percentage of what we do in the Lord, coming to church and listening to a message. We still know that God is in control and he's doing great things uh, in and through every single one of you families out there. And and uh, you're just a blessing to me and my family. And it's just exciting to see what God is doing uh, through you. And... Um, uh, lately, we've been uh, hearing, and I just wanted to touch on it a little bit before we pray and get into our story. You know, what about the UFOs that have been happening out? You know, that, you know that's the big thing, all the rage right now, right? And all the media. You know, are UFOs real? Are is life on other in other galaxies real? Um, I would venture to say that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and He focused in on the earth. And everything he created on earth, including earth, was good. And you hear John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We know that that uh, the enemy can be, he can transform, his. the Bible says he could transform himself into an angel of light. He could transform himself. So all this talk about UFOs, I just want to be quite frank. I want to get to the point. I believe that it's a distraction. And it's, and what is happening with this UFO sightings, quote unquote, and everything that we hear going on, and oh, government cover, cover up, and all of, all of a sudden it's coming out. Come on now. You know, Frank, just to be quite honest, I believe that uh, it's a distraction, getting the people's eyes off of the true problem, things that are happening on the border, things that are happening uh, financially, inflation, and all that stuff. And I believe that this is just another another thing that the enemy is trying to do to try to distract even the Christian audience. And we have to understand that uh, the Bible says, for God so loved the world, that the Bible says that he created the earth and everything in the earth he created was good. And yes, there were other planets, but where did he send his only begotten son? Did he send his only begotten son to Mars? Did he send him to Jupiter? No, he sent him to this world. And so, is there anything biblically sourced where I can uh, assume that there's life on other planets? Biblically speaking, no, absolutely not. But what I do think is this. Now, this is from my mind. I really feel that we're very close to the end. I really feel with all my heart that, you know, you're going to see more and more hype about these UFO sightings and maybe abductions and, and, and people, you know, uh, the government even maybe blaming uh, absences or abductions, you know, blaming these UFO sightings and people on other planets taking uh, people from Earth. You know, and you know what? I really feel that that things are being prepared right now, church. Things are being prepared right now. We're coming close to the end. We're coming close to uh, Jesus coming for his church very soon. 
And my one encouragement to you is don't look at the distractions. Don't look at what's going on around you. Look to the Lord. Look to his word. Trust in his word. Be ready in season and out of season. Be ready for the coming of the Lord. Because when the trumpet sounds, there's not going to be any opportunity to repent. There's not going to be any opportunity to say, I'm sorry. Think about it. The Bible says that when he comes for his church, when the church is raptured, it's going to be faster than the twinkling of an eye. That's faster than you could blink. Now, how fast can you say, I'm sorry? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Lord. You know, how fast can you say, I'm sorry? In a blink. How fast is a blink? You know, how fast can you say sorry? And then on top of that, how fast can you say sorry and mean it and, sh and, and, and show repentance? Come on. I believe that this world is trying to get your attention off of the Lord, the enemy, the one who could transform himself into an angel of light, the one who's a master of disguise, the one who's the father of lies. Understand this, that when the Lord comes, calls his church home, when, when the, the bridegroom calls the bride, the church, and the church is raptured, the word is in the Latin rapturus, or being caught up in the air. You read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. What's going to happen? Immediately, everybody that knows the Lord will disappear. And what are they going to do? They're probably going to blame it on aliens. I really feel that. You know, you look at the, the pursuit of the one world monetary system, one world government. Our president really has no power and is seen as very weak. Is this going to be the time where the Antichrist begins to rise up? You saw the Dome of the Rock un, un, under fire. Where, is this going to be the opportunity for the Antichrist to present himself and say, go build? Because when he says, go build, we're gone. That's how close we are. Two people will be grinding in the field. One will be taken. One will be left, right? We have to be ready. Pray with your children. Pray with your husbands. Pray with your wives. Pray. Set up a systematic devotional time. Know the Lord. Look to the Lord. Spontaneous conversations with your sons, your daughters. I was just talking to uh, Greg, one of our worship leaders here yesterday and he was talking about the spontaneous conversations with his son and just being ready we have to be ready because i think it was uh i forgot what pastor said that he he believes that the most impactful times in his son's or his kids lives were those spontaneous times when they come to you with a question and they ask you you know what about this what about that what did jesus do here how would jesus end? and we have to be ready with an answer we have to be preparing our families, preparing our hearts. We have to have our bags packed, our toothbrushes in hand. It's, it's one of the worst feelings when you go on a trip and you don't have your toothbrush. We have to be ready. We have to be ready for what's in store for us. And I really feel that all this divisiveness, all this stuff that's happening is meant to distract you, church. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. Let's keep our eyes in the Lord. Let's keep our eyes fixed on the things of the Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day, and we thank you for your word now. As we get into your word, and we trust in what you're doing uh, this evening, Lord God, we just pray that you would continue just to fill us with your spirit, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in our lives, Lord God, those things both seen and unseen, Lord. Those things, Lord, that uh, we have a tendency to uh, not understand or, or maybe not uh, or may just happen in our lives and we don't even notice. And, but Lord, you're working in, the, in the, even in the small things because your desire is to perfect in us your plan and the image of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're in 1 Samuel chapter 8 this evening. 1 Samuel chapter 8. I thought I'd just touch on that for a little bit. And uh, I don't know if you've had any questions about what's going on. So I, I just felt led to go that direction this evening. But uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, we'll finish these two chapters, believe me. 
So uh, chapter 8 we kind of touched on already, and uh, we see in the first verse of chapter 8, well now we come into a section of scripture where uh, Samuel, it says, you know, they, they call Samuel old, and I kind of take offense at that. You think about uh, Samuel, Samuel was 52 years old at this time, and they called him old. And it was almost like, well, you can't handle the nation anymore. You can't, you can't, you can't live up to the job anymore. And and your sons are wicked, you know. And I have something to say about that also. But look at this. Just the first couple of verses. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now notice that Samuel was essentially the last judge of Israel. His sons weren't weren't effective one one bit, and they weren't appointed by God. You you never hear of any kind of supernatural empowerment upon his sons to judge and to deliver Israel. No, we don't hear that, but we do hear that about Samuel. And that's probably a good Bible trivia question. Who is the last judge? People will be all over the place, but it's actually Samuel himself. He was he was not only priest, but also judge. And if you think about it, there were only three in the Bible. One was Moses, one was Eli, and one was Samuel. So it's interesting that we have both a king and a judge, or I'm sorry, a, a priest and a judge here uh, in Samuel. And uh, apparently uh, the people think that he's not fit for office of judge and priest any longer. It's interesting how people love to talk, isn't it? People love that people have their opinions. People think that, you know, they, and right here, you can see from the onslaught of chapter eight, that people are looking at the outward appearance, that people are looking at the external, that people aren't really looking at the heart. People didn't see that Samuel was going about through a circuit as he judged and in Israel. He went to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and he judged all Israel in those places. He was going through all these places and spending long, long weeks and, and even months in these places, making sure that they were maturing. And that's probably, we could probably conclude logically why his sons were wicked. He wasn't really there. He, you know, being full-time ministry he was he was gone a lot and so his his sons rebelled and the job that they were supposed to be doing was was not the job that that Samuel expected them to do and they were wicked and and they were turning the people aside and people you know just like Eli's sons you know Eli's sons you know made the hearts of the people regret coming to bring sacrifices to the Lord and here are Samuel's sons, and they're being paid off under the table, and, you know, you know, say a quick prayer for me, and, you know, it's just, you know, they were just being paid off under the table. But look at this. But his sons did not walk in his ways, in the ways of Samuel. So Samuel was a godly man. And it's just proof. We look at, at Samuel, and we, you know, having a heart for the Lord is is not a strong indicator that your kids will also walk in the Lord. There will come a time where they will make decisions for themselves. That's why, you know, it's important to set up uh, scheduled devotional times and spend time with your kids. You, you know, I uh, pray with my boys every evening. We, we talk about the Bible. We share Bible stories. And I, I wish I had, it's in my closet, but, you know, there's the Ten Commandments that we we just go over one and I just pray it over them and you know just you know spending that time with them and and just equipping your kids you know we we can't control what they will do later on I understand that and that's one of my biggest fears as a pastor I try to include my boys in everything I include my my sons in everything that I do you know, I'm going to Washington to go speak at a men's conference and doing uh, uh, their Sunday morning service in Ellensburg. I'm bringing my wife and my kids with me. Early on, I experienced, you know, Michelle and I, and Michelle can testify that I was gone a lot. I was called away a lot, and it affected our marriage. And I know now how important it is to include your family and bring your family and my sons and include them in ministry events and and be with them you know and and not you know not coddle them but but give them opportunities to serve and let them see you serve in the ministry let them see you serve faithfully there, there's something about a powerful walk that really uh, makes an impact in a, in a child's life especially 
a, a, a you know a parent who loves their kids and loves the Lord, and they know that that they have a strong conviction for the Lord. Man, it 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 affects our kids, and even if I'll, I'll tell you this much right now, I did a lot of youth ministry and college ministry. I think I did college ministry for longer than I did, well, probably about the same. But you could see when rebellion starts to happen. You could see what happens in the middle of the rebellion. And then many times in in the college age, real life is hit. And many of the kids remembered the things that their parents told them and shared with them and prayed with them. And they realize, wow, you know what? I need to come back to the Lord. I need to honor the Lord. I need to, I need to get in my devotions. And, and experiencing college ministry, I experienced a lot of kids coming back to the Lord. And so you, you could see the impact of sharing the word of God. I don't care how rebellious your son or daughter may be. If they're not walking with the Lord, they can never eliminate the conviction of the Holy Spirit the Bible, the word is so powerful that it stays with them. It does not return void. That means it doesn't just disappear. It's not something that they forget. That's something that they're going to remember forever. You're training your kids. And, and sometimes we as parents, we can look at our kids' lives and, 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 oh my goodness, why did they talk back to me? Or, oh my goodness, why did they do that? Or, oh my goodness, look at their friends. And we start like worrying about every little thing. Now, there's, there's protective mode. There's, you know, mom, Michelle would say mama bear mode. And yeah, okay, fine. But, you know, trust the word of God to work through your kids' lives. Trust. Trust the Lord. There was an airline pilot that was uh, new, newly licensed, and he was flying through a storm. And all of a sudden, he started to get panicky. And what happened is he got panicked and didn't know what to do. And all of a sudden, he hears a voice in his ear. He says, remember your instructions, and we'll take care of the obstructions. We remember to obey the word of God and remember this. God will take care of the obstructions. And this is true not only for your life, but your children's lives. Now, Samuel's boys didn't walk in the Lord and and they were, it says that they were wicked. They didn't walk in his ways. Now look at this. So all the elders gathered together and what happened is they gathered together and they requested a king. They requested a king. And you look in verse 20. What does verse 20 say? It says this, that we may also be like all the other nations. We want to be like everybody else. Now that's something that our probably teenage kids would say, right? Or have a tendency to say, why are they always doing, why do they get to stay out all the time? Why are all my friends outside? Why are my, why, why do my friends get to stay home from church? Why do I have to go to church all the time, Right? And, and the same attitude begins to come out from the people of Israel. Now, Saul consults God, and that's the first reaction. I love that. It says this. Look at this. In verse 6, it says, But this thing displeased Samuel. And when they said, Give us a king to judge us, so Samuel prayed to the Lord. What a great first instinct. Is that our first instinct to pray? We see that he was upset. He was heartbroken over, over the request for a king. They were in essence denying the king of kings and the Lord of lords. They were denying God. They were denying the theocracy, the theocratic government, that God would rule over them. Instead, they were choosing a monarch or a monarchy where a man would rule over them. We want somebody that's going to go before us in all our battles. Don't you remember last chapter? Don't you remember the days of Joshua? Don't you remember Exodus? Don't you remember when, when God delivered the people? Don't you remember when he divided the Red Sea? Don't you remember when he divided the Jordan? Don't you remember that he fought all the peoples in this land and he went before you? And the Bible says that, that God went before them and fought their battle? But how easy it is when people are not 
in the things of the Lord, when they're not in, in the word, when they're not in worship, when they're not turning to the Lord to worship him, when they're not praying, how easy it is to forget the amazing power and omnipresence of the Lord that he is with you wherever you go, the Bible says. And they forgot. And what does God say? God says, okay, give them what they want. Listen to them. Give them what they tell you. God says in his words, heed their request. I believe that's one of the worst things that can ever happen. The worst things that can ever happen. I really feel, you know, um, you know, that God allowed the, the children of Israel to have the request. Sometimes God will allow people's requests. And, and you know, I, I consider even those that are sinning, those that are living a life of sin, those that are, that are, that are in rebellion, God will allow them. He'll allow them to go the way. The worst judgment for those that continue to refuse the, the will of God, the worst judgment for them is for God to say, go ahead. You look at Romans chapter 1. The Bible says God gave them over. Oh my goodness. What do you see happening here? You know, people, you know, through this whole last election and stuff like that, you know what, as a Christian, we think biblically. We vote biblically. We are called to walk biblically. And I got a little, a, a lot of flack on social media because, hey, you know what, I, I, I was voting for a particular person and this and that. You know, I vote biblically. How does the candidate feel about abortion? This, this is really what a Christian should be looking at and this is the lens that we look at through abortion marriage israel abortion marriage israel and and as icing on the cake freedom of religion that's what i look at it could be a democrat it could be an independent it could be a republican i don't care that's my lens and I really believe that, man, a lot of the stuff that we're encountering right now as a nation is, is so sad. So sad. And you know what? I, I, this is, I, I know that God is allowing this to take place. And the only thing I could think of, really, just like here, God eventually led them through the 120, 120 years of monarchy and, and they, they, you know, he led them through this, right? But just like when God leads us into storms, sometimes we find that the storms end up directing us where God wants us. And, and the people of God are going to experience a storm sooner or later. They're going to experience Babylonian captivity. They're going to find out where monarchy... There are a lot of good things that happened with the monarchy, but there were a lot of bad things also that happened as a result. There was this, I, I read this little clipping about these boys, these newspaper boys back in the day, back in the 20s or something like that, when they were delivering papers in Westminster and they were whistling this tune that would play over this, uh, and, and it, it, well, they were whistling this tune. All these newspaper boys would whistle this tune and they were all off tune. There were people, why are they singing? Why are they whistling that song off tune? And the reason is, is because the music box or the clock tower or something like that that they were listening to was out of tune. So they were whistling out of tune because the source of where they were getting the music was out of tune. And so I feel that that happens a lot with even people. They're out of tune with the Lord because they're watching too many people that are out, out of tune with the Lord thinking that, oh, this is the way, this is the way. And, and they're confused and, and, and they're anxious and they're looking all around. And, and then you find yourself walking out of tune with the Lord. And the people of God were out of tune. And Samuel said, tell the people this. Notice this. He's praying to the Lord. He's whispering in the Lord's ear, right? 
he's telling the Lord, this is what the people are doing, the first instinct. And God says, tell the people that this king is going to take, he's going to take, he's going to take, he's going to take, he's going to take. But the end of chapter 8 says this, we don't care. We want a king. We want somebody that we can identify with. Whoa. Wait a minute. Back up. Does God want us to identify with the world or identify with him? They say that we may also have a, a king like all the other nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Hmm. Think about it for a minute. Let, us, let it settle in. They just said, we want to be like all the other nations. Interesting. And that in and of itself is a failure. Lord, create in me a clean heart so that I may not sin against you, Lord. Lord, help me to be more like you, Lord. That should be our prayer. Lord, help me not to be so caught up with what's around me. Lord, get rid of the noise and fill me with your spirit. That should be our prayer. Not make me like him. Make me successful like them. And, and Lord, oh my goodness. What are we... What are we using as our criteria for success? Is a house, riches, um, a lucrative job, is, are all those uh, successful in the Lord's eyes? God may bless us, but is that successful in the Lord's eyes? In the world's eyes, yes. I've been in third world countries where People have nothing. And for doors, they have a curtain. They live in these shelled cement buildings. And they're smiling. And they're, they're so happy to show me their baby and have me hold their baby. I've been in places like that. And I said, I said to myself when I'm walking out of there, man, they're more happy in their present condition than most people are with, with their wealth in the United States. Don't think that wealth and materialism is an indication of blessing. Please. We need to keep our focus on the Lord. And Samuel heard all the words of the people and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, listen to their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, every man go to his city. Then there was a man in Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zerah, the son of Bacharoth, the son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. Notice that. He was a Benjamite. So where do you think the first king is going to come from? He's going to come from the tribe of Benjamin. Is that God's ordained line of monarchy there's no doubt according to i believe it's deuteronomy 17 that god desired monarchy but in his time and in his way this is 10 years before david so here they're raising up a benjamite when actually the king god's ordained order is from the the tribe of judah notice this and he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. So he was choice. He was grade A beefcake. Saul, head and shoulders above everybody else, right? So that's what he's saying. He was choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. And there was a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel, or not a more handsome person. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, Please take one of the servants with you and arise and go look for the donkeys. So he passed through the mountains of Ephraim, through the land of Shalisha, 
and they did not find him. Then they passed through the land of Shalim, and then they were not there. And then he passed through the land of Ben of the Benjamites, and they did not find them. And when they had come to the land of Zu, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us return, lest my father cease caring about the donkeys and become worried about us. Let's let's go back home so my my dad doesn't worry about us. And he said to him, Look now, there is in this city a man of God, and he's an honorable man, no doubt that Samuel's reputation went throughout the whole land of Israel. And it's interesting how Saul's going around the, all these areas and exposing himself. And people are, oh, who's that? Whoa, you know, it, uh, you know imagine the reaction. Here's this beefcake Saul, right, uh, walking through all these areas. He's, there's no doubt that people are noticing. And, and I wonder who that is. You know what I mean? And so check this out. His servant says, well, wait, hold on a second. Before we go home, let's do this. There's a man of God, and, his, and he's an honorable man, and all that he says surely comes to pass, right? That's Samuel's testimony. All, all that he says comes to pass. That, what that means is that he's a man who truly understands and knows the Lord. That, that he's a man who whispers to the Lord, and the Lord whispers, whispers back to him, right? He, he talks to the Lord and the, talk, and the Lord talks back to him, right? And, and I, I, I really would venture to say that. You know what, church? It's a good thing to talk to the Lord. It's a good thing when you're driving just to lift up your heart to the Lord. It's a good thing, just don't close your eyes. It's a good thing that when you're out there that you would just uh, pray. You could pray. Paul said pray without ceasing. I think it's a great thing. I, I think, you know, sometimes when you, when somebody like, you know, when somebody has a difference with you or, or starts yelling at you or whatever, you have, you, you have the ability to pray. If you're in the attitude of prayer, you'll be less likely to lash back. Now look at this. He was an honorable man and, and everything he says surely comes to pass. So let us go there. Perhaps he can show us the way that we should go. I love that. And then Saul said to his servant, But look, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread in our vessels is all gone, and there is no present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Look, I have here at, one, at hand one-fourth of a shekel of silver. I will give that to the man of God to tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, Come, let us go to the seer. For he who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. So they used to call the prophets of God seers. They would see things that nobody else could. So they looked at Samuel as one who could see things that nobody else could. So naturally, here they are. They're coming to try to find uh, Samuel. And look at this. When Saul said to his servant, well, then Saul said to his servant, well said, come, let us go. So they went into the city where the man of God was, and they went up to the hills to the city, and they met some young women going out to draw water and said to them, is the seer here? And they answered them and said, yes, there he is just ahead of you. Hurry now, for today he came into the city because there is a sacrifice for the people today on the high place. As soon as you come into the city, you will surely find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Now therefore go up, for about this time you will find him. And they went up to the city. And as they were coming into the city, there was Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. And now the Lord had told Samuel, notice this, I, what I just said, look at this. Now the Lord had just told Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came saying, tomorrow about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin and you shall anoint him commander over my people, Israel, that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their cry has come to me. So when Samuel saw Saul, 
The Lord said to him, There he is, the man whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people. And then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Please tell me, where is this seer's house? So the Lord whispered in Samuel's ear, A person who prays is a person who hears. Let's make it our aim tonight to pray with our family, to pray and lift up our hearts to the Lord. Let's make it a point. Let's, let's really lay something out before the Lord and say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to pray. And I'm, I'm praying according to your plan and your will. Lord, it's all about your will. I'm not going to try to call, you know, blessings from heaven. Lord, bless me. Lord, bless me. You know, just, just shower me with blessing. You know, that's not prayer. Come on. Praying, true praying is, Lord, forgive me. Lord, show me your plan. Show me your way. Lord, let your will be done. That's praying. And you'll find that when you pray that, that you'll experience the blessings of the Lord regardless. So, prayer, mm, essential. You want to hear the Lord? Then you have to pray to the Lord. You have to lift up your heart to the Lord. Just be honest. Lord, I'm struggling. Lord, I'm having a difficult day. Lord, I love you. Lord, I'm frustrated. Lord, bring, bring just a fresh outpouring of your spirit upon my life. And, and lean into the Lord and watch the Lord truly work. Now check this out. So Samuel answered Saul and said, I am a seer. Go up before me to the high place. For you shall eat with me. That's, isn't that awesome? How Samuel points him to the high place first. Samuel points him to the place of sacrifice first. You notice that? I don't know if you notice that. I think that's a beautiful thing. Anybody that you find yourself accountable to, oh, it's always good to point each other to the place of sacrifice. It's always awesome. Now look at this. But as for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not be anxious about them, for they have been found. Notice that. The very thing that probably Saul was worried about, anxious about. Don't worry about it. God took care of it. Don't we find ourselves like when we're in the storm, we're looking at the debris, we're looking at the, the, the lack of being able to see, you know, the diminished uh, uh, eyesight, uh, the wind, you know, we're looking at the things, the elements, and you know what? God's already took, taken care of them. You know, we just, we just trust his word and trust the instructions, and God will take care of the obstruction. Now look at this. And Saul answered and said, am I, am, am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel and my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak to me? Speak like this to me. So you, you get that there is a degree of humility in Saul at this time. There's a degree of humility. Like, who am I that you would talk to me this way? Who am I that you would honor me this way? Look at this. Now Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into, this, into the hall and had them sit in the place of honor among those who were invited. There were about 30 persons. And Samuel said to the cook, bring the portion which I gave you, of which I said to you, set it apart. So the cook took up the, the thigh with the upper part and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, here it is, so the shoulder and the heart, the area of the heart, the breast, right? Here it is, what is kept back. It was set apart for you. Eat, for until this time it has been kept for you, since I said I invited the people. So Saul ate with the Samuel that day, and when they had come down from the high place into the city, Samuel spoke with Saul on the top of the house, and they arose early, and it was about... The dawning of the day that Samuel called to Saul on the top of the house, they were flat roofs. Remember, they were flat roofs. And they would often go to the top of the houses to get some rays. Get up, that I may send you on your way. And Saul rose, and both of them went outside, and he and Samuel. And as they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, 
tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And he went on. But he notice what he says to Saul. But you stand here a while. Stay with me for a minute. So I could announce to you the word of God. Oh my goodness. So here begins a whole different page in Israel's playbook. They're given the monarch the monarchy that they called that they called for. Saul has humble beginnings, but oh, there are some difficult days ahead for for Israel. The Philistines will rise up. There's going to be tension between God's chosen king and Saul. And you know what? It's just amazing how God is a God of such patience. He is long suffering. His mercy is is abundant. Oh my goodness. As we read these chapters, these are written for our for our instruction. May we lean into the Lord and seek to hear him. May we lift up our hearts. May we allow him to take care of the obstructions. May we may we learn of him. May we learn of everything that he is is seeking to teach us. And may we say, Lord, make me more like you. Father, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity that you've given us just to be here and just to honor you, Lord God. And we just thank you so much, Lord, for our time of worship, Lord. And and uh, Lord, thank you, Lord, that um, uh, you're doing a work in, in your church, Lord. I pray for all those now, Lord, that may be struggling right now. I pray, Lord, that you would give them victory and strength over all that they may be struggling with right now, Lord God. Lord, we know that you're able to take care, just like you took care of Saul's donkeys. And that pilot, you took care of the obstructions and you allowed him to land safely on that landing strip. Lord, we know that you take care of all the extremities. Lord, may we just be mindful of our relationship with you. May we just look to you and say, Lord, you got this. And you got me. And there's nothing for me to worry about. May I stand in trust and faith. And may the fear just fall away. Lord, we thank you. And we praise you for your goodness. I pray if there's those that have been watching this evening. If you don't know the Lord and you want to receive the Lord, I want to pray with you right now. Just repeat this prayer. Dear Jesus, please forgive me because I know I'm a sinner. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me and dying for me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that, the Lord has come into your life. He has forgiven you. He's seeking to take residence in your heart. And the Lord is just going to do an amazing thing in your life. Father, we thank you for Calvary Chapel Eastville. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord. If you receive the Lord this evening, contact us. Let us know. Post right here or even contact us through the church app. Let us know. I ask Jesus into my heart and I would like a Bible and we'll send you one. Father, we thank you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you, church. I love you so much. And uh, it's a blessing to have Melanie here. Oh, my goodness. All right. We're going to end with a worship song? All right. Let's do it. We're going to end with a worship song. God bless you, church.
bless. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Amen, amen.